will you also start the recording now not now but i will speak. okay okay we are live okay so we we should start um welcome everyone today it is our 41 webinar in this series as you know our all events are open to all and free for all it is our try to promote plant science soft skill and some other tools techniques and uh, discussion to help the research community and plant science enthusiasts throughout the world we are very happy that we have a great eminent scientist on right from the usa uh he also one connections with the norman bollock the um, he bollock uh, was his mentor so i request uh, shoma to introduce bioengine and then i will require i will be request to priyanka gupta she is a postdoc uh, and from the morocco uh, i uh, request for to introduce our speaker then jacinta will do the interactive session with the speaker so let's start and everyone be patient i will give the password after the webinar talk and interview session it this password is very necessary to fill up the e certificate application so let's begin our 41 international webinar Hello everyone. Welcome to BioEngine, a platform from which researchers and scientists can present their research to the world and future scientists can gain knowledge, perspective and inspiration. We are doing this through webinars and publications. Thank you for being a part of today's webinar series. As more people are joining in, let me provide some housekeeping information related to today's webinar. please note that after attending today's talk you can apply for a certificate of participation for this you need to submit feedback form that you received after registration you need to enter a password in the form that will be provided multiple times in the youtube chat after the presentation when you fill out the feedback form please remember to mention the full name of your institute and the full institute address You can collect your participation certificates after 2 to 3 days from our website. BioEngine does not send certificates through email. Please note another important information regarding the email address that you use for BioEngine webinar registration. Please make sure to use the same email address for registration and the feedback form. mismatch in email id may result in non identification of participants and your certificate may not be issued please be patient and listen to the talk don't worry about the password it will be provided in the youtube chat at the end of the webinar the password will not be shared by email it will only be available in the live chat please make sure that you that you have enabled youtube chat on your device so that you can interact and submit your webinar related questions we will collect all the relevant questions for our speaker today's event is different it is not on plant science research but on something that we all crave professional development to build a successful career we require many qualities or soft skills we learn some of them from our home and school and we unknowingly use them in our everyday life and eventually get good at it However, when we start building our professional career, we need to become more independent and at the same time we start facing new challenges. We feel the need to develop new skills to address these new problems and for that we must learn how to use them successfully. Today you will learn about professional development at different stages of your careers from a highly renowned scientist Dr Fred Chollick. He has joined us to share his real life experiences and discuss how soft skills can help you build a successful career. I request Priyanka to please introduce our speaker. Thank you Priyanka. Over to you now. 
Thank you, Soma. Before I introduce Professor Kolek, I would like to share my personal experience with Fred. A couple of months ago, when I had a discussion with him, he inspired me by his wisdom. And one of his key statements became my favorite. He said, creativity comes from individual, but productivity comes when individual put together. And told me, you people do not have a gray hairs, still young, so challenge me by asking difficult questions. Therefore, today I request to all my fellow researchers, students, challenge Professor Kolek after his talk and engage him with your burning questions. So before I invite Professor Kolek for his presentation, it is my great pleasure to give his formal introduction. Professor <clears throat> Kolek is a former president and CEO of Kansas State University Foundation in the United States of America. Prior to that, he was Dean and Director of Kansas State Research and Extension. He spent a long time of his career at the South Dakota University where he led spring weed breeding program. He has a long experience, including five years in US ed and 30 years of teaching and research administration. He had an opportunity to work with renowned personality including Drs. Norman Borlaug, Anderson, and Sanjay Rajaram, who were the core of the WEED program at CIMIT. He is a fellow of many professional societies, including American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, etc. Presently, he is an advocate of Borlaug Training Foundation and mentoring the next generation breeder. With this brief introduction, I invite Professor Kolik for his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Khalid. Thank you very much, Vinja. Uh, before I pull up my slides, uh, Sonia summarized my speech extremely well. <laughs> Sonia, uh, you don't know that. Uh, the soft skills, those hard skills. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna walk through my career as an example, um, and I'll pull up the title here in a minute. I'm going to give you my contact information at the first, but I'll repeat it at the, at the end as well. But what I really, really am here to do is, is, is to serve as a mentor. Um, uh, as I am retired now, uh, and I want to start this by saying my, my career plan was really started uh, when I did, was an undergraduate and I decided to get a PhD in, in plant breeding and genetics. Uh, that really, even though I didn't know it at the time, even though I didn't realize it, um, and I had no plan per se, uh, that was my first step in that process. So I'm going to pull my slides up here, I believe. And can you see them? And let me go to full screen. Why can't I sign that? Uh, I can't seem to find full screen. Uh, no, sir. Actually... Yeah, it's not shared yet. You need to. Oh, it's not shared. Yes, not shared yet. Okay, let me shrink it. I thought I shared. Give me a second. Being retired. Um, uh, why won't it share? That's interesting. I have it pulled up. Hmm, I'm having difficulty. Okay. Sorry no, about that. No problem, sir. Take your time. It's it's okay. It, uh, maybe uh, you start from the share screen one second and choose the first option to share your whole screen. Okay. Let me uh, let me shrink it back down because I shrunk it. Okay. Share screen and I get your screen. I do not get my screen. Interesting. No, you, you, I think you get your skin because uh, in your skin, it's also, uh, also this window is available. Give me a second here. Okay. Okay, share screen. 
And now I hit my presentation. Yes, sir. You it's have it coming. Now. It's coming. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, okay. Once again, I apologize. I am. I am not. I am retired. I am not technological. <laughs> See, I need to learn some new skills. Yes. Uh, yes. But no, yeah. no problem. Now, so it's, it's, now I need to figure out how to get it on so it's full. I can't get it to full screen. Is that adequate? Do you think? Uh, yes, it's uh, adequate. But if you want to full screen, then I need to start the option. Is it? I'm not using this uh, software actually, but uh, I can find the full screen option. Well, I can't see. I I, uh, I, I don't have. I uh, nor normally I do it in PowerPoint. Okay. But. Uh, okay. uh, so uh, maybe in view option, the the top bird, top yeah, in the view okay. option, you maybe have the full screen option. Okay, slide uh, sorter, uh, slide sorter, toolbar, toolbar, toolbar. No, nope, I don't. No, no, there is nothing like so. There, nope. there should be an icon in this slideshow. Yes. Show first slide, start. Uh, Slideshow settings, start slide first. There we go. Yes, yes. Okay. 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 Now you tell me when the rest of the audience uh, joins us. Or are they here? Yes, sir. They, they, are, they are ready to hear you. Okay. Let me, let, let, me, uh, let me add one thing before there. And I know it's already been said, but please ask questions uh, whenever you have them. I can't see chat now because I'm on full screen, okay. but okay. please put them in the chat room. Okay. Uh, so what I want to talk to you this evening or today or this morning, depending on where you are, it's evening where I am, is a professional development plan for plant science enthusiasts. And, and what I really want to do during this time is convince you to develop a personal, a professional development plan. And I want to emphasize that it is not necessarily a plan that you know in your head today. And I'm gonna use myself as, as that example. So let me kind of start with the question. Whoop. Whoa, whoa. Uh... This is not the right presentation. <laughs> no problems. You can. Okay. Let, let, I'll, I'll, I'll make it work. Okay. Okay. So let me start with a question. And the question is, is, do you have a professional development plan? Like I said, I can't see it in your chat. But, but if you do, I want you to think about your professional development plan. And if you don't, I want you to ask me more questions at the end about how to develop the professional development plan. How I started developing my, my plan, um, as I said, when I was getting a PhD, it was my major professor. Uh, my major professor said, you know, you really need a plan of what you want to do with your career. And he made several suggestions that how to develop that plan of which I'm going to use, use today. And as I've already said, part of what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my own career as that process. So I know you heard a little bit about my career, but um, I'm a plant breeder trained. Um, I have, uh, and uh, it was both research and teaching. I moved into university administration. Uh, I was a department head, a director of research, and the dean at South Dakota State University. Then I went on to be the dean at, at Kansas, dean and director at Kansas State University. Then I really shifted to careers and I became a, a uh, president and CEO of a foundation raising money for the, for the university. I'm still active in teaching, uh, but now I work with youth, primarily youth, on how to enjoy the environment, enjoy the outdoors, um, and, and uh, to fish and to uh, un understand uh, the, the nature with, that we live in. When I finished that PhD, which we'll go back to in a minute, I did not have this as my plan, okay? I planned on finishing it beginning with PhD and being a plant breeder, uh, develop varieties, train graduate students, can conduct research. 
But as I will point out in a few minutes, this plan laid out as I did my reviews of where I was. So kind of what are the components of a professional development tent? Well, it's to obtain those skills, knowledge, and technologies to be successful in one's position. And the skills, as someone said, there's a lot of soft skills. It's not all, it's not all hard schools. There's a knowledge. Knowledge is never changing and technology is never ever changing. So as you complete a PhD as I did, and I tell this story a lot, when I was in my PhD program, I took a developmental genetics course. In that course, five PhD students extracted DNA from Kiwi, okay? That was in 1975. My daughter did that in middle school several years later. So that just tells you how much more knowledge has changed in, in techniques of change and development in a very short period of time. So the question is, will the skills and knowledge and technologies you have today be sufficient for your career? I will contend the answer to that question is no, in, without, without reservation. And I can, in my career as a plant breeder, the technologies and the knowledge I needed to be successful at the end of my career was different and I added to it. Well, you, need, you will need a new set of technologies in your current position or if you change careers or change positions. There's no question you need it for both. But the second one, if you change careers as I did, you have to develop a complete new set of knowledge, skills and technology. Really what it really boils down to is that last line. And that's be a lifelong learner. And I emphasize a lifelong learner, but what I'm trying to also emphasize is that professional development plan will lead you to what you need to learn. You don't learn at random. Um, a number of years ago, uh, I worked with a group that talked about how we sequentially learn. And, and the analogy that I really like to use was you don't read a book by chapter one, chapter five, chapter 10, chapter three, chapter 12. You read a book because it builds a story or it builds knowledge. If you don't lay out a plan in a lifelong learning plan to develop that knowledge, it's like reading a book randomly and going through that. And I will contend that you'll be much more successful if you don't. Well, there you know. So do you have a professional development plan? I believe it's critical that you develop one and I'm gonna tell you why as I go through this process. So what do you wanna accomplish in your career? Uh, you know, that changes with time. Uh, in myself, as I come back to my, my, uh, my, my positions that I've had through time, uh, what I wanted to accomplish was very different. Uh, when I finished my PhD, I wanted to be an active plant breeder. Uh, in fact, I thought I was going to retire as a plant breeder, uh, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, would you go on a road trip without knowing the destination? I would contend that you're lost. Having a professional development plan lays out that map for the road trip. Or if you don't know where you're headed, you won't know where you'll end up. And I think even though we think we, we have our, uh, it in our heads, I'll contend that you, um, you have to put it down in writing. I'll also hope to convince you your professional career will go by very fast. Uh, I retired six years ago after 35 years of active uh, research and administration. Um, and boy, I don't know where the time went. Uh, I'm glad I had a plan that I'll talk about in a minute uh, to guide me through that. I believe a plan is needed for you, a professional down is planned. Your professional development will help you chart your future. I think everyone wants to know kind of what their future is going to be. Uh, we never know for sure. Uh, and that future can be laid out and sometimes it changes. So this was my career. I had a PhD from Colorado State University in 1977 in plant breeding and genetics. In 1972, Dr. Norman Borlaug came and gave a presentation to the, at, the, at the university. My career plans when I started that PhD or when I when was, was in the middle of that PhD changed when Dr. Borla gave the presentation. 
he enthused in me and he infused in me the need to work internationally of which I, I did. And, and uh, I even continued to do with the Borlaug Training Foundation. So when I finished that PhD, I spent five years with the spring wheat, uh, winter by spring program with Simu, with Dr. Rajaram. Uh, I was on the, I led the winter side and he led the spring side, spent a lot of time with in, in Simit, uh, spent a lot of time traveling, loved the job, loved the people I work with. But I had, my, I, as I wrote through my plan, the thing that was missing was I wanted to run my own program. Um, and, and as much as respect as I have for Simit and being funded by USAID, I, I was lacking that run, run my own program. The second thing that, that struck me in my, that I wrote down in my plan was that I was spending about six months a year away from my family with two young children. So I said in my plan, I wanted to run my own program. So I looked for a position and I found a position at, at South Dakota State University. And I spent 10 years as the spring wheat breeder leading that program, training graduate students, which I still believe was probably my greatest contribution I did have the pleasure to release seven varieties that were very successful, and I also taught. Well, I'm sitting now in my career and I'm looking at my plan, and I said, you know, I, I really love being a, a plant breeder, but you know, I, I see administrators that don't necessarily help people. So I decided to move into administration and it was all written in my plan. So five years, I was head of the department, uh, and then four years, late, four years I spent four years as the director, and then six years as the dean of, of the College of Agriculture at South Dakota State University, a position I planned on retiring in, to tell you the truth. But I had an invitation to move to Kansas State University and be the dean and director there, and I, um, I accepted it. And then after 10 years in academia, I totally changed my careers and I became a fundraiser for the university, president and CEO of the foundation raising for the university. I will fully admit at this point, that change, I was looking for something different and I'd written down that I was gonna look for something different to, for my last five years of my career. And so um, I sought out that opportunity at 65, I retired, I still do volunteer work and I still serve as a mentor. Now my question to you, even though I can't see you in the chat room, is there a pattern? Well, I truly believe that there is a pattern if you, if you look through that. Uh, roughly every five years or in five year blocks, there's two 10 year blocks, I changed jobs or changed careers. That's because I had, had written a five-year plan. And my five-year plan was to continue to, to move on and not necessarily, I, but at the end of five years, I didn't have to change jobs. I didn't have to change positions. I would stay in the position because that's what my, what my written plan said to do. So my approach to professional development, I discovered my 35-year need to know knowledge and skills for various positions. I mean, obviously a PhD in, in uh, plant breeding genetics with minors in statistics and pathology set the stage for that, for that first 10 years or 15 years of my of a gym. I, I can't emphasize enough that I, I loved every position I had, but at the same time, I also seek new opportunities. And to my wife, that was always strange <laughs> uh, as, as we talk about it. Uh, if you really like what you're doing, why are you seeking new opportunities? Well, it, it's because I, I'm a ch I challenged myself and I challenged myself in my plan. So I would challenge myself to say, you know, is there something you want to do? The one thing I want you to really understand is you don't do this because you think you accomplished everything in the last five years or you accomplished everything in that position. That is, that is the absolute wrong approach. The other wrong approach is to randomly seek opportunities. I used to say, you know, it's one thing to seek opportunities. It's another thing to see opportunities and seek them. To randomly seek opportunities is, goes back to reading that book randomly. As my goals changed, my professional development changed, and I found opportunities 
to learn knowledge and skills that I didn't have. There's many ways to do that. And I've just listed a few uh, workshops, seminars, reading lists, attending this uh, webinar, observations, um, and identify new mentors. Uh, I'll come back to mentors in, in a minute. Mentors had a tremendous influence uh, on, my, on my planning and a tremendous influence on my career. Um, anyway, so at the end, after looking at this and looking at, as I went through this process, incidentally, I still have my, the book with all my plans written in it. Um, I developed an action plan, kind of a roadmap of where I wanted to go professionally in the process. In your present position, you obtain a set of skills and knowledge, whatever that position is, whether you got a PhD in genetics, plant breeding, agronomy, pathology, statistics, whatever that is, that, that you obtain that set of skills that you, that you needed. Um, you will continue, in, if you continue that position, you need to continue to obtain those skills and that knowledge, new skills and knowledge. As I said, uh, you know, the, the whole concept uh, of molecular biology was just on the rise of becoming knowledgeable when I, when I moved out of my role as a scientist. If you change positions, you definitely will need new skills and knowledge. And reflecting on where you are at this point in your career, um, the plan can help that reflection. It, it quantifies it for you as you look at that reflection as, as you move through the, through the career. So steps to consider, evaluate current situation. And it's not necessarily uh, that you're, you're happy with your present position or unhappy with the present position. It's just, it's just to evaluate. Uh, I think as, as individuals, we do an awful lot of evaluation. We do a statistical analysis, but evaluate where you are in the, in the process. You identify career, career goals, short-term and long-term, and I'll come back to that. But it's important that you look at both the short-term goals as long as the long-term goals. Then you have to identify the skill, knowledge, and the resources to acquire them. You know, as I indicated, as, you're, uh, as a lifelong learner, it's not like you're getting a PhD or a master's where you go to put together a course of study and set together a research project that lays out the skills, knowledge. Now you have to look at the resources to find them. Develop an action plan to obtain those skills and knowledge. And I emphasize the action is, is, is actually critical. Once again, I'll use that word seek. Seek out what those skills and knowledges are. Uh, a mentor can help you in this area. Evaluate the plan. And uh, I'll contend as I did it, I evaluated it on an annual basis, but every five years, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And then you must be committed to the plan. You know, um, during my administrative time in, in, in universities, I would get all these requests for a planning from the, the provost or the president's office or the dean's office. And, and, you know, I often wondered when I completed that task, which took a lot of time, did they really do anything with those plans? And this one is your is a personal plan. So you have to be committed to it, you have to review it, and you have to continue to look at where you go professionally. Evaluation. Uh, you need sufficient time uh, for, for an evaluation uh, of your plan. As a plant breeder, uh, even using some of the new techniques, uh, what devil hybrids it was just starting to be developed, it takes time to find out if, if, you're, if you're, you're making progress, whether it be developing resistance, developing germplasm, whatever, whatever that is. It also takes time to determine if you're making progress as an administrator. Are you making a difference for the faculty that you're leading? I contend you have to write the plan down in t when the time to evaluate it. If you don't write it down, you don't bring it up. Uh, I've given this lecture in a lot of places. Uh, I've seen a lot of people a lot of people develop a plan, not go and look at it, but develop it in their head and forget what the steps are. So write it down with relatively a lot of detail to the plan. Uh, my plan as a plant breeder, for an example, and I'll talk about goals, was, was I wanted, my goal was to release a variety every year as a plant breeder once I got my program established, which was in the last five years. 
uh, of the 10 years I was a wheat breeder at South Dakota State University. Also tell you I didn't achieve that, but I'll talk about that too. Write down your evaluations. Um, once again, uh, and be honest with your evaluation. You're evaluating your, your future. You're evaluating your plan. You're evaluating where you're, where you're headed. Make adjustments if necessary. Um, and, and even though I've I wrote it down every five years, and then I went back and read it, uh, because of circumstances, sometimes I would say, okay, uh, that, that isn't what I was going to do. And, and I, would, I, would, uh, I would make adjustments in my plan throughout my career. And I, I suggest that you would have to too. And that adjustments more, go more for opportunities. Uh, if an opportunity comes up, uh, make an adjustment. I annually reviewed it, but the annual review was more just to look to see uh, every year, but I did an in-depth evaluation every five years. Five years is a sufficient amount of time in order to evaluate uh, where you are. I say, but be flexible. Uh, as you saw in my career, there was a four year and, and a six year in there. Well, my plan was to move a, um, a year or head or a year behind that, but I, it wasn't, I didn't have the, the, the opportunities weren't there and I wasn't gonna just change jobs because I've loved every job I've had and I loved all the people I worked with. So if you develop a plan, have it in writing, and do an excellent job of evaluating it, just like you do an evaluation when you do when you evaluate a research project. Be a mentee. Um, I can't overemphasize that. I was super lucky uh, in my career. I had three or four absolutely fabulous mentors. One was my major professor. Uh, incidentally, he's 91 now, and I still stay in contact with him. Uh, one was Dr. Warren Cronstead, uh, who was the, um, the wheat breeder at Oregon State University, served as a mentor. Roger Olmson, uh, when I worked with Simmet, uh, continued to be a member, a mentor. Uh, tremendous loss when we lost him to COVID, uh, a, a day that was very difficult for me. Dr. Borlaug uh, was an outstanding mentor to me. Uh, and and I, I, as I said before, uh, they challenged me. I challenged them with questions. So let me give you an example here of, of, of a mentee. I'm um, in between my master's and my PhD program. And my major professor worked a deal with Simmet for me to spend three months at CDOT Obergon with Simmet as a special trainee. About a month into that, um, I noticed that Dr. Borlaug, Dr. Anderson, and Rajaram would all go to the field at about 5.30 in the morning. I went up to Dr. Anderson, because that was through him, uh, and said, can I join you in the morning? Here I am, a young guy, coming up to Dr. Anderson, or Dr. Borlaug. And he says, he said, sure, you can come with us. Well, the next two and a half months I spent with, 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 that, with them. Uh, and the number of things that, that Dr. Borlaug said to me or Raj or Anderson um, literally changed my, my, my whole outlook on life um, in the process. Incidentally, uh, to, after that 1972 uh, when Dr. Warlock made the presentation, I wrote down in my plan that I wanted to spend time with Summit. Uh, I had modified it right there. Uh, and I, at that point in time, I didn't know I was going to spend five years working with Raj and Summit. Identify individuals that you believe will mentor you. Um, it's a process. A mentee-mentor relationship is, is a very important relationship but it has to be, it's based on a lot of trust. Um, it's based on a lot of individuality and not all mentees and mentors work out. Ask your mentors questions. All questions are good questions. Uh, I've said this over and over again. I asked hundreds of questions uh, in, in that process. The mentor should tell you to think about your, your position in your future and then develop a network of colleagues. The mentor can help. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, colleagues in in this process 
uh, are the mentors are, are necessarily a confidant, but colleagues can also, as you can visit with colleagues. I would also tell you that your colleagues and your mentors do not have to be necessarily all plant breeders, if you're a plant breeder. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, was a soil scientist uh, that had tremendous influence on my career as we had a chance to talk about uh, various items. So don't get narrowed in that you have to have a mentor-mentee relationship uh, with someone that's necessarily trained or working in your discipline. Let me change gears here a little bit. Uh, let me talk about goals. In, the, in your professional development plan, you have goals. Uh, those goals are set out. Uh, and, and so I think a little discussion of goals is important. Set your goals high. Uh, and and I, I can't overemphasize that. As I said, uh, my goal is to release a variety every year in the program that I ran. Uh, I didn't make it, but it, it was a goal. My goal was also to, to graduate two graduate students per year. Uh, when I was an active graduate student, I averaged about 1.5. I didn't quite get to two. Uh, but those were my goals, some of my goals when I was an um, active plant breeder. Uh, one of my goals when I became president and CEO of the foundation was to have the foundation raise $150 million. Uh, the board and a lot of the staff thought I was crazy. At that point in time, the foundation had never raised over $100 million in its history. And uh, in the third year I was president and CEO, we raised $211 million. Uh, so my goals were always high. Uh, the next one though is very important. And this is my definition. Once you achieve a goal by definition, it's no longer a goal. Uh, once again, I'll, I'll use an example from for my wife. Uh, you know, as, as a plant breeder, you could drive through the countryside and recognize your varieties sitting out there. And, I, you know, I'd say, you know, that's my latest variety. Prospect was one of the ones I released. And I said, now it's the one to beat. It's, and she could never figure out, well, my goal was to have it in farmers' fields. Uh, but it was, the new, it was the new target. I wanted to, wanted to set a new goal to hire and hire, in this case, set a goal to achieve higher yield, higher resistance, uh, better quality. One of the things that, that I found is not meeting goals does not mean failure. And I think that's so important. Um, not learning from your not meeting goals is not good. Learn from those. But not it's not equating to failure. Um, and, and a lot of people, when, I, when I've reviewed professional development plans, which I'll give an opportunity here in a little minute or so, is, is they think, because I didn't achieve it, I'm failing. No, no, it's, it's not. If you set your goals high and you make, reach every one of the goals you set for yourself professionally, I will contend you haven't set your goals high. Goal setting has been proven to increase performance, set the stage for success, and as a good way to motivate, not on yourself, but the people you work with. Professional development and leadership. Uh, I've also give lectures in leadership. And, and, you know, there's the expectation that leadership development is coupled with professional development. And I, I, I really do believe that. And, for an organization to be successful, leadership is required at all levels in the organization. If you expect the department head or the dean or the director or the CEO of any organization to provide all the leadership for the organization, there's a great chance that the, lo the organization will not be successful. I truly believe e-leadership is required at all levels. Uh, some of the skill sets I talk in a minute are the same, no matter what level you are in the organization. Leadership requires a set of skills and knowledge. It's a different set of skills and knowledge than you received when you, you received your PhD. And I'll give you some hints here in a little bit. Uh, how do you attain those leadership skills? Well, read books, read articles, attend leadership workshops, lectures, seminars. Those are all great. I've done them all numerous times. I would have to say that I think probably one of the best ways for an individual to develop leadership skills is observation. 
uh, as agronomists, as plant scientists, we should all be good observers. Um, and observing those people in leadership roles is, is to me the best way to really say it. Now, some of those, some of those things are, that you will observe, you'll say are negative. Well, then don't repeat them. Some are positive, reinforce those in, in, in the process. So anyway, I, I truly believe that, that professional development and leadership are coupled, particularly as you go through your career. But once again, leadership is required at every level in any organization. So I boiled things down because I, that's the way I like to do it. Uh, what are some characteristics of a leader? And I mean a good leader. Listen, 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 listen. Uh, I just cannot overemphasize listen. Uh, collect data. Now, data is information analyzed necessarily without statistics. Well, you know, as minors in statistics, I always thought you could analyze things and figure out what's different. Well, when you're a leader, you don't necessarily have the statistical tools to analyze this information that goes into your head. Uh, and so, uh, the organization is more important than you. Uh, I can't overemphasize that without without any question. So as, as a leader, you have to think about the organization first and you second. Make decisions. The worst decision a leader can make is no decision, okay? No decision is absolutely stymieing. It's been my experience and as I said, I spent almost as equal number of years as a research scientist as I did as an administrator. There is forgiveness for bad decisions, but there is no forgiveness for no decision. So if you don't make decisions, it stymies the organization. I'll say the same thing's true for a plant breeder. You know, I live by the philosophy as a plant breeder, when in doubt, throw it out. I still remember a discussion I had with my, my graduate students we were looking at our advanced yield trial and, and uh, one line was always like third or fourth, never quite at the top or fifth. Every year, fourth, third, fourth, third. And I said, we're throwing away. And they said, why? It's at the very top. It's even in the statistical top group. I said, it's never going to get at the top. And so I lived by the decision, went in out, throw it out. I said, well, how do you think maybe it would have done better next year? Well, I had new, new lines for next year. So you've got to make decisions. Be willing to say you made mistakes. Um, I, 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 I made mistakes and I always fessed up to them. Be humble, concentrate on the future, not dwell on the past, but remember the past. Uh, I think uh, Einstein said, you know, an, uh, an individual that does the same thing over and over again, expects different results is a, is a definition of insanity. So, but I've also seen, seen people in leaders and, and in their plans when they develop leadership plans concentrate so much on the, on the past that they don't look out into the future. So there's a balancing act there. Well, I always believe in take home messages. I don't know how I'm doing for time. I know I started, I'm probably going a little bit fast, but that's okay. Um, take home message, determine the future by developing a pro professional development plan in writing. Set those goals, set them in so that you see what they are and hold yourself to those, to those professional development, to that development plan, develop, professional development plan. Review and evaluate. Actually, in, in my experience, the review and the evaluate is probably as important, if not more important than what I wrote down, okay? Because I, I, that review tells you whether or not you are making progress to those goals. That review tells you if you're, you're making progress in your career. And that review, review also tells you that if you, it's, it, for me, it's time to seek additional opportunities. Obtain those knowledge and skills and technologies, knowledge, skill, and technologies to be successful. As I've already said, it's not like you're in a PhD program or a master's program and you have a, a plan of study and a research project that you've laid out. You've got to obtain these, these skills and knowledge now. You have, to, you, have to, you have to seek opportunities to acknowledge those skills. You also have to figure out what those knowledge and skills are. As you move through your career, they're different. The soft skills will also increase as it's already been said. Okay, action is required. 
you absolutely have to take action within that process. I say transition from a mentee to a mentor. Uh, I'm serving as a mentor right now uh, to two young plant breeders in Pakistan. Uh, I've served as a mentor, I, even I'm post-retired. I've also served on a journal review uh, uh, from, from, uh, from Jordan. So you transition from mentee to mentor. Now, does that mean you don't continue to have mentors? No, I, I still continue to have mentors. Uh, yeah, as I said, I communicate frequently with my major professor today. And leadership is needed at all levels and be a leader whether it be a leader of a program, a project, or whatever that organization is. My final thoughts, balance your professional and personal life. I can truly say as I look back at my career and as I look back at my professional plans, nowhere in my professional plans that I had was that I write down my personal life plans. That was a mistake. If I could do it over again and start over again, I would put personal life plans in there as well. When I moved and worked with USAID and, and, and Simit for that five years, I wish I would have realized how much time I was missing with my small children being traveling six months out of the year. If I would have had a profession, if in my professional plan, if I had written a personal life plan, I would have seen what was happening earlier. Life's too short to not have fun along the way. Uh, as I've already said, I can truly say I was blessed with my mentors. I can truly say I was blessed with the people that I worked with um, and I enjoyed. Now, did I look forward to going into the job every day? No. I mean, there were days that were, weren't as good, but I've truly loved and had fun along the way. Make a difference. In your professional development plan, that's one I probably haven't emphasized enough. How do you make a difference, whether it be the people you work with, uh, whether it be the projects that you're on, what kind of difference will that make? And so I, 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 I implore you to figure out a way to make sure you, you can make a difference in that process. One of the ways I would say to any plant scientist is, is develop the next generation of professionals and leaders. Uh, putting it in Dr. Borlaug's terms, develop the next generation of hunger fighters. Um, and, you know, so let's, let's just assume, you know, that you uh, got a PhD at 30 uh, and you're going to, and you're going to work to 65. So you have 30 years of your professional career to work uh, in, in, in that process. Okay. Let's assume you're a plant breeder. Let's assume you were a very successful plant breeder. And let's assume you release 20 varieties during that time in, in variety development. Well, if you educated 10 graduate students or 20 graduates through that time, and each of those released 10 varieties, you tenfold your impact on developing that next generation. So I always felt that it was our role as plant scientists to develop that, develop that next generation. I talked a lot about plant breeding, but I want to emphasize it's you can be an agronomist, you can be a statistician, you can be a pathologist, you can be an entomologist. If you're a plant scientist, I, I think you need to look at that. Like you look at developing that next generation of professionals, or as Dr. Borlaug said again, the next generation of hunger fighters. Knowledge and skills are learned, seek opportunities to learn. Uh, I, 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 I never, missed a seminar when I was in graduate school, uh, even though some of them weren't necessarily something that I wanted to go to. And I had probably something else to do for my own research or whatever. Uh, but those were always an opportunity uh, uh, to learn when you went to the seminars from your other, your other students. Um, I just think back of how my career would be different if I hadn't attended that presentation by Dr. Borlaug at Colorado State University. Be a lifelong learner. Uh, I, uh, and, and if you're a lifelong learner and you have a plan, it'll tell you what you need to learn and how you may for, uh, go through it. Plan your future uh, and, and be, but be somewhat flexible. The last one is windows of opportunities are open for a short period of time. Be prepared. 
uh, I think as, as I've talked to various individuals who develop a professional development plan, they, they really are those windows of opportunity. Uh, do not stay open very long. So make sure you can, you can uh, uh, be, be prepared if you want to uh, either continue your, in your present career, uh, move on to a different career or move on to a different position. As I said, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, this is my contact information, uh, Dr. Fred Chalik fchalik at gmail.com. The phone number, uh, 785-410-1866. That's a U.S. number. I'm also uh, active in WhatsApp as well as Signal. Uh, I'll close this and then hopefully go to a, a chat. Uh, is I'm open for any question. Uh, if you want to contact me uh, by email, please contact me. Uh, and, um, and I try to respond to all my emails to, to, to my mentors. Um, and so the only thing I would ask that if you do send me an email, please put in the, in the subject line professional development. Uh, that way I know that it will have been tied back to this presentation. So uh, with that, I will gladly try to answer any questions and I'll go back to my screen. And um, there we are. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, we we are collecting the questions from YouTube, but before that, we wanted to do a interactive session with you, uh, okay. like interview. So our viewers get more time to ask more questions, okay. and they already start asking your question, and we are collecting it. Okay. So I'm going to stop your presentation for right now because uh, it's, uh, it's, I think you don't need the presentation for that. Okay. So I request uh, Jacinta to do the interactive session. And there is a, a very interesting uh, talk and I'm, I'm very happy you include personal and professional life balance because uh, sometimes we are we're so much focused on our professional life that uh, it's, it's, it's required. It's also balance our mental health uh, if we try to build the, our professional and professional life balance. And uh, uh, it was something that, uh, well, I have very few regrets in my life but I wished I would have started balancing my professional and personal life sooner in my professional career. Let's just leave it that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I would, I would say things about my daughter doing things and my wife would say, well, if you would have been home, you'd have seen your son do that too. Uh, so Jacinta, please uh, go for the interactive session. I will collect the questions and put it here after okay. two minutes. Okay. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, thanks, Dr. Chalik, for joining us today. Um, I think the first two questions I'm going to ask are related to the presentation that you just gave us. Um, you mentioned a lot about the importance of having a mentor to guide you towards building your professional development plans. Um, do you have any suggestions for our viewers um, on how to go about finding a mentor or starting that discussion, asking someone to be a mentor? Uh, yeah, uh, be brave. <laughs> uh, here I am. Uh, you know, I'm 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 22 years old. I walk up to Dr. Anderson and Dr. Borlaug and say, "Can I go to the field with you?" Knowing that if I did that, I would develop a relationship, and they would be mentors. So the first one's be brave. Okay, that's 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 the first one. Uh, if you've gone to graduate school, start with your major professor, whether it be for your bachelor's or your master's. So that's a place to start. That, I mean, that's, that's somebody you work with, you're familiar with. I go back to your colleagues. We have colleagues, and then they can tell. So I teach in the basic wheat, pro, wheat improvement program at Simmet. And so I get to interact with those students, and they will contact me. They have contacted me and say, would you be a mentor? I've yet to turn one down. Okay. So, but if you say no, continue to seek out those people that you, you, you revere. Now, 
my other comment is don't necessarily pick all those people with gray hair and gray beards. Okay. And gray hair. Okay. Uh, don't be afraid to pick somebody young as a mentor. Uh, Cause they, then you can grow together. I have one of those too. That soil scientist that I talked about, he and I shared each other's professional development plans. Okay. His was very different than mine yeah, because of what he wanted to do and what his profession was, but we shared them. So don't necessarily have to be plant breeders talking to plant breeders or soil scientists talking to soil scientists or agronomists talking to agronomists. So seek out those people. And then if they don't challenge you, just kind of back away, <laughs> you know, and, and then seek out another one. There's no reason to insult anybody in the world. So in the process, so, but you got to be bold. That's number one. You got to be step up there and 22 year old walks up and, you know, and I, and, you know, Dr. Borlaug told me for years to call him Norm. I still can't do it, you know, today, because I just can't. <laughs> okay, thank you. If I don't um, answer the question, shoot at me again. That's great. Um, it's just your thoughts. There's no right or wrong or anything. Um, <laughs> we're, just to, we're just trying to get to know you a little bit better with these questions, yep. I think. Uh, okay, let's say I have a you know, a professional development plan, what are your thoughts on having a plan B or a contingency? Does that exist or no? <laughs> plan B or contingency, good question. Um, I, I, I guess I, I wouldn't have a plan B. I would have, I would be flexible with, with the plan. Um, you know, so in 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 mine, uh, after my ten years as dean and director at South Dakota or Kansas State University, uh, I was spending about fifty percent of my time raising money. <laughs> I mean, I didn't realize that that in you know a large university that the dean spent as much time with donors raising money as he does anything else. Uh, he had three associate deans that ran the research, teaching, and extension side of the of the, of the college. So I I was on fundraiser. I found it to be enjoyable. So in my second year of that, five years of that, I said, you know, maybe I ought to move into a fun, more of a fundraising role. Well, a long story short, the president of the foundation retired. I applied for his job being a dean. I, thought, I figured, well, you know, why not? Well, they hired me, which was even more shocking. And then I had to go to school to figure out what it is to run a foundation, a billion dollar foundation. So. I would have a plan B, but I would have the flexibility to take a look at how your career is moving you and then put it in your plan so that you can move forward. So maybe that is a plan B <laughs> in your plan. <laughs> how about that? Right. Um, okay. Uh, what motivated you to build a career in science? Is there anything you haven't mentioned in your... Well... Okay, uh, I got to tell you a story. Um, I went to Oregon State University to get a bachelor's degree in agronomy and go back to the farm and to play football. I used to play football at Oregon State at the time, okay? Um, so let's deal with the football first. I uh, was six foot, two and a quarter, and I found out taking physics, why you hit somebody six, six, 320, they don't move. You can't get enough velocity behind the mass to get the job done, okay? <laughs> so put that career to the side. And um, at the end of my, uh, at the beginning of my junior year, I was meeting with my advisor and I was in agronomy with the business minor. Cause I really believe if you're in production agriculture, you should have the science base and then the business base. And he said to me, and I can quote him to today, you have straight A's in science and straight C's in economics and business. And this is the quote now, that should tell you something. <laughs> and it did. I, would, I enjoyed the science much more. I went home, told my parents I wasn't going to come back to the farm, and I switched to a graduate, a pre-graduate science option and to go on to graduate school. So okay. I guess I'm not sure if I made that decision or Roger Fendel, my advisor, did. <laughs> um, okay. I think everyone's excited to know. Uh, what was your experience like working with Norman Borlaug? Oh, what was my experience work with Norman Borlaug? Um, life changing. Dr. Borlaug changed my life. I sh there's, just, there's just no other way around that. Uh, 
to kind of continue. I, I, I not only spent time with him in the field, uh, you know, uh, talking. I also traveled with him in South America and North Africa later. Um, he, um, his humanity was so great. His passion for people was so great. His love of training the next generation. You know, if he would tell me, he told me of all the success I've had in breeding and moving wheat around the world, training was as if not more important than anything else I accomplished. That's where I can quote him. Um, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, son, don't be afraid of the honest varieties when we were selecting. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, it's, 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 it's a, it's a tr tremendously great question and I can't do an honest, I can't do the question, honestly do the question justice. Uh, he, um, he, he, he was such a, he, he was a unique individual that combined such great intellect with such humility and such humanity. I, I, I've never met anyone like him other than maybe Glenn Anderson was close. Didn't have near the career, died of cancer way too early. Uh, was his counterpart, Dr. Anderson, and probably never got the recognition, but they were very, very much alike uh, from Canada. Uh, I, I guess I, it's, I haven't done your justice on the question, but I, I, I enjoyed every minute with Dr. Borlaug. I have a picture of him on the floor playing with my son on the rug. Uh, I took him fishing. Uh, I hitchhiked with him in, in, in Argentina when our car broke down. We rode in the back of a truck. That's just the way he was. I mean, you know, he, um, tremendous intellect. I, I, that's just the way he was. I mean, he, when the car broke down, he, he stuck his thumb out. And we caught a ride and jumped in the back of a pickup and we're riding across the Pampa in, in Argentina. <laughs> that sounds amazing. He was. Um, yeah. Um, okay, let's change it up a bit. Um, as a plant breeder uh, or former plant breeder, what's your opinion on uh, the CRISPR genome editing tools? I, I was reading that to you. He sent me some questions. I read through them. Um, first of all, there's no such thing as a former plant breeder. Okay, so that's first of all. You're, you're, it, it's like malaria. You know, once you get infected, you kind of have it for life. It, not quite true, but it's a nice saying. Uh, I, I the, the new technology with CRISPR has so much, I mean, I almost, if I wasn't retired and quite so old, I'd almost like to go back to school and use some of this new technology and do some things that I, 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 guess, I guess what I would say, I was a plant breeder with a sledgehammer and today's plant breeders are surgeons. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a great technology. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, you, you, you don't have it down here, but I'll talk about genetically modified or GMOs. I spent my whole career modifying plants. I mean, that's what I did using, using Mendelian genetics. Uh, I put a resistance in from a line for Hessian fly resistance and insect resistance. And that, that gene produces a protein that kills the larva before it can impact the plant. And, and, and as when I retired, we still hadn't been able to identify the exact protein because it, it was such small, minute amounts. That's a genetically modified organism, is, is it not? Um, with that said, I will also say I, I want the safeguards in place. Um, you know, as, 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 as human beings, we don't necessarily have a very good track record of taking care of our resources, our soil, our water, our air, or our climate. I, I could go into climate change, but I won't. But we have the technology now that could, could, could really mess up the organization of, of organisms on earth. And so I want safeguards in place, but I think it's fabulous technology as long as the safeguards are in place. Right. CRISPR is one of them. Um, <laughs> yep. So the next question actually is about um, what are your thoughts on climate change and global warming effects on agriculture? Scary. Yeah. Scary. Uh, I worked with wheat. Wheat's a cool season grass. Okay. A C3 cool season grass, uh, which means that it does not like heat. <laughs> uh, 
uh, it needs it likes cool nights so that it can it can uh, it, it, it can recover from daytime stress after the stomata close and re rehydrate itself with turgor. Okay, uh, I mean Dr. Borlaug made the wheat plant so it could go around the world. Climate change may prevent it from going around the world. Okay, uh, because it's a cool seeding grass. Uh, I live in Bend, Oregon right now. We are in the fifth year of the worst droughts we've ever been in. Uh, a lot of the area areas here is irrigated. Um, our reservoirs are, are 16, 20%, 40% uh, going into the irrigation season. Um, we've luckily had some rain this last week. Uh, we went seven months with not, not, not even a quarter of an inch or two centimeters of rain uh, this summer. Uh, which is highly unusual. Uh, we, can, we can sit and argue all we want about what's causing it, okay? I mean, even though I do think mankind's causing it, it's changing. Agriculture, we're gonna have to use, we're gonna have, once again, new knowledge, new skills, new techniques to deal with it. You know, I, I don't know if you can change wheat from a C3 to a C4, uh, but it'd sure be interesting to try uh, with some of this technology or rice. And I, I pick on wheat and rice because they're the number one and number two calorie crop for mankind. Uh, and, and, and so um, I, let me put it this way. I, I think climate change is gonna, this next generation or next two generations of plant scientists are gonna have a greater challenge by magnitude in my generation because of climate change. So I guess I go back to what I originally said, scary for, for food production. Yep, that's fair. <laughs> um, okay, what is your opinion on farmer education? Educating the farmers. Well, um, I think it's, it's you, know, you know, let me back up as a plant breeder, my, this came from my major professor. He says, if you develop a variety and it's not in the farmer's hands, it's done nothing. It's had no, it's made no difference unless it's a production. Okay. And, and I'm going to use Dr. Borlaug again in one of his stories. Um, it's almost 60 years ago when he started the basic wheat improvement program. They, they didn't call it that then. When he brought a group of farmers and technicians to deal with how you deal with these things called a semi-dwarf, okay? He wanted to educate them on how to deal with this technology. Well, the long and the short of it is the semi-dwarfs have a short coleoptile, which means they can't emerge from being, being seeded too deep. The first introductions failed because they treated them like traditional varieties and they seeded them too deep. They could not reach the, the, the sun, so they died. Okay, so if farmers aren't educated to understand that, to know what the differences are, then you're, you're all the science in the world isn't gonna make any difference because the farmers are the ones who produce the food, okay? <laughs> and so I'm very much in favor of farmer. In fact, work with an individual in Tunisia that, that works on a farmer to farmer. Let farmers train farmers. Farmer to farmer education is, a, is fabulous. I think on-farm research is fabulous. Uh, I had demonstration plots all over on, on farmers' fields, not on all the experiment stations, so farmers could see what, what the varieties look like. Uh, you know, so I'm very much in favor of farmer education. I had the pleasure to take both from Oregon, South Dakota, and Kansas, a group of farmers to see Senate. And I can guarantee you, they were very, they, you know, they, they were very, they learned a lot uh, when we spent that week at Ciudad Obregon and saw what Simmet was doing. In this case, it was as important for them to see what global impact of wheat it was as it was production economies. So it, it kind of squelched all that argument about, about helping uh, international, international agriculture. So uh, I, farmer and farmer education, but once again, I think, once again, you gotta be, what skill sets, what knowledge, what technology do you want the farmers to have? 
So that's that's a that's a that's a good question. Okay. Um, okay. Um, how do you think we can get more women into science? That's a really good question. Uh, we're just we're trying to get more women on <laughs> active in our in our board. We we just just did that at our last board meeting. Um, I think you've got to go back to the root, uh, and 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 that is education in the primary schools. Uh, get them interested in science and technology at that point. Um, you know, uh, we've got some barriers to break down. Uh, I I. Uh, I, two of the sharpest graduate students I had in my time were both, both females, uh, challenged the heck out of me, which was, which was good because I asked my graduate students to, to challenge me. Uh, I think it goes back to being, being a mentor. Uh, you know, seeing someone like you definitely helps, you know, when, you, when you're in the school and in, 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 in place. I think you gotta, we gotta be more cognizant of recruiting uh, females of opportunities uh, as as we move forward, uh, but I think the, there's the barrier with the science. In and uh, you know, uh, my wife and I went to the same high school together, and she was fabulous in science. In fact, they wanted her to go on in science. It just wasn't what her passion was. Uh, so I, I think you got you have to go back and, and recruit at the, at the at the at a young age and get kids turned in science. I think some of the stuff that's going on, even though I don't necessarily agree with everything in the space age, I think some of that is, is getting through to that science and technology is a career for women. I, I think that helps. Uh, I think anything like that would, 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 would help. Um, then I think, then it'd be on, beyond onus of people active in the area if, uh, is to seek out women. Yeah, uh, to work on a project, to work in a career, work in science, to seek it out. Uh, that's the one. One of the graduates I had was an English major, <laughs> and uh, she worked for the project as an undergraduate. And I recruited her to get a master's and PhD in plant breeding genetics, and now runs. Well, she's retired now, but that makes you feel old when your students are retiring. Uh, but for for years, she ran one of the largest uh, soybean breeding stations for the company Pioneer. So, but she worked for me in the summer just, you know, as a part of the crew on harvest. But I talked to her into going to change it from English to, she had a little makeup to do. <laughs> oh, sounds like it worked out really well though. Yep, she's done a great job, um, Debbie. Awesome. Uh, when you recruit um, a research fellow or a graduate student or someone for your department, what sort of qualities would you be looking for perhaps other than academic qualities? Well, I've, I've, I, I, I firmly believe in leadership. Uh, so uh, obviously uh, when, when, when I interview someone, I, I really try to figure out if they've got good listening skills <laughs> uh, in the process. Uh, I, I like individuals that are outgoing. Uh, I'm an extrovert, my wife's an introvert. She's, I've actually read books on how you deal with introverts differently. Not, not just, you don't have to just be an extrovert in order to be outgoing, but uh, that's something that I want, you know, one of those skill sets when I became an administrator is how do you deal with introverts uh, uh, being an extrovert. And I think that was a very important skill set that I learned. Uh, but, but I look for people that are outgoing. I, I, don't, I don't mind being challenged, you know, what the position is, uh, how I can grow growth. I want, I want people that are, I guess if, if you really boiled it down, to two things is listening skills and passion. Do they really show passion for, for the profession, passion for the job, passion? Uh, I, uh, I think passion can lead you an awful long ways as long as you've got the basic uh, skill sets. Okay, great. Um, so you're a reviewer for many international journals. Could you give our viewers um, some tips to improve their manuscripts? Yeah, um, I, um, without a question, um, I, I guess be precise. <laughs> uh, I don't like, <clears throat> uh, even though I do go on and on when I talk, I, I like things to be b being done precise. Uh, I, I believe in, in that you need to lay out what the hypothesis is 
the abstract to me is the most important part of a, of a, of a journal as, as you go through your career and you get into all these things. Sometimes that's all you get a chance to read is the abstract. So I think an abstract that truly does summarize, summarize, summarize the article. Um, I, th I think presentation wise, um, the logic. So the paper should build logically to a conclusion. So how you put the data together in, in a paper, you know, you know, you got an introduction, you got the materials and methods that, that tells the audience what, what you, you know, what you wanted to do and how you did it. But then how you present that data isn't necessarily the same way that you collected it, if that makes sense. So make sure your data is organized so it builds to a conclusion in, in, in the presentation and then of the, of, the, of the results in the discussion. I personally prefer results and discussion in one section. I don't like them separated. I don't want to read the results and then have to go back and look at the data to look at, to look at the results to when I'm reading the discussion. So I prefer results and discussion to be combined as you go through it so that I can look at what your thoughts were uh, and then precise, uh, be precise in what you laid out. That, that's kind of kind of my hints as, 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 as manuscripts. Okay, thanks. Um, I think this is, oh no, we've got a few more questions. Um, so time management um, is obviously quite challenging as we grow professionally. Do you have any tips for our viewers on how to better manage time and or maintain a work-life balance? mentioned that. I've already confessed I'm not good at that. <laughs> so you got me. No, no. Maybe in your, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, now you've got a few more insights. Okay. Uh, probably the, 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 the thing that the thing that finally I, I realized is, is, is how to manage that time is really keep track of time. Okay. Now, if, if that makes sense. So I'm an early riser. So I typically would be in the office 637. Uh, that way I had a good hour to an hour and a half before most people were there to get things done because uh, then it was disrupted in time. But keeping track of that time so that you can make time for other things. So uh, I learned that I have to take breaks. I mean, I would, I would, I would, I'm the type to go to the coffee pot at, coffee break and go back to my desk and drink it at, eat, drink it at my desk. Well, I, I learned that I, I, I needed breaks. Uh, you don't make sure you make the best decisions when you're tired. Okay. So uh, I started to take breaks. Uh, uh, I started to go on walks during my break. If it was a nice day, I would go out and I would walk for maybe a mile and then, and then, and then go back, back to the office. So I, I learned that time I learned to manage my time, not man let time manage my life, if that, if that makes sense. So I, I learned how to, to utilize my time differently for the balance. Relative to personal balance and, and, and professional balance, I, I, number one, I married the most understanding women in the world, which, which really helped. But uh, I, I, then I, 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 I would take my work home with me. When I, earlier in my career. And I learned to separate work at home, work in home. So when I was home, I was home with her or was home with the children. I wasn't multitasking, reviewing a manuscript or doing whatever I was doing. So that helped balance that. And then I, I learned that you can actually take a vacation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it took a while. Uh, and you know, I don't care if you're the head of the breeding program or the head of the university, head of the college. One of my other mentors in my leadership life said he demanded, in fact, he was kind of almost my boss. He demanded we, we be out of contact for two weeks. We, we, we could not email back to the office for two weeks every year. Uh, the first year I did that, I broke the rules. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the second year I did. So um, I think a mentor can help on that too, uh, as you go through that. But if there are three things looking back on it is don't let time manage you, manage your time, 
separate your professional and personal life so that when you're at the office, you're at the office. And when you're at the home, you're at, you're at the home. It, take breaks at work and then take breaks with the family. Okay, thank you. Which I didn't do for my first 20 years. But I'm glad you're giving us this advice now. So. <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> um, do you have any words of advice on professional conflict resolution? Yeah, I, I saw that in your list. Um, you know, um, I, I think it goes back to when there's a conflict, goes back to listen. Um, listen, collect information, step back, analyze, make a decision. Okay, so when... I would sometimes get an email that would be very, um, I didn't like, <laughs> just, just, just leave it at that, I didn't like. I would type a response and in my computer, I had a hold box. Now the hold box had a 24 hour hold on it so that I would type it all up and then I would put it in hold. And then 24 hours, I, I wouldn't touch it. I actually had a, I mean, I'm a, time, I'm a timeaholic. So I had a clock, set the clock. 24 hours later, I would open it up and I would read it. Yeah, or sometimes it would be later if I had meetings and stuff. And I'd say, you know, that's just going to cause conflict. I would trash it, rewrite an email, and then send it. Okay. Step back, think, analyze the situation. Don't go with first response see what, why you're part of the problem or part of the solution, okay? And then respond. So I guess as, as I look at that, that's the order I would go through. The worst thing you can do is respond immediately because that will escalate. And that escalation never gets you anywhere, whether it be in your personal life or your professional life. Maybe take a walk, walk away. Okay. Think things through before you open your mouth. That will take care of most conflict. If that doesn't take care of it and it continues to be, and you're in such of a position, in my case, I, I had to go to university lawyer. Okay. Ultimately the person was dismissed from the university because of the conflict she was creating. Okay. So you may have to go to a higher authority in the process to help resolve that. And don't be, don't be afraid of that, but don't do that first. Do not do that first. Try to resolve it yourself first, okay? But sometimes you can't resolve a conflict and you have to go to a higher authority in the process, okay? I mean, I was one of two people, I think, in the history of Kansas State that fired a tenure, fa tenure faculty member. But I did it with cause and I did it after everything. I tried everything I knew to resolve this situation and it didn't resolve, so I went to the lawyer. Okay, um, all right. So this is gonna be the last question just to change it up. Um, do you have any words of advice or inspiration for the new students or scholars? Um, the part I missed the question, no. Um, no. Yeah. Do you have any words of advice for the students who are new to the field of research or plant science? Oh, new students. Yeah. Oh. Man, you got the world ahead of you. Take the tiger by the tail. Okay, no, <clears throat> advice and counsel. Um, don't try to do everything at once. Okay. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm very serious about that. Uh, you know, there's still debate whether multitasking is possible. Uh, I'm one that believes it. My wife believes you can't multitask, but don't, don't, try, don't try to change the world overnight, okay? Take logical steps. I've already said one of them, develop a professional development plan right away as, as, you, as you go through that. I've already said another one, pick out mentors, uh, figure out who, who those mentors are in your, figure out the colleagues that you can, can work with in the institution or whatever, whatever organization you're in, whether it be a company or, or a, 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 a state or university, whatever, figure, figure out some colleagues. 
write down that plan, not only write down your professional development, but write out your research plan too, in this case, if you're going to be in a research plant research. So, you know, what, what you want to kind of do in, with your research, research program. Um, continue to learn just because you have a PhD and I'm assuming you're a PhD. Uh, don't, don't stop, don't stop learning. Uh, continue to seek those op opportunities to learn. And then the last one we've just, you just talked about, you know, make sure you got that lifelong balance uh, as you go through it and, and look forward to a professional, a good 35 year career or, or so. Uh, but I can tell you, it goes by like a blink, blink of the eye. It really does. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so that wraps up the section from me. Okay. Um, but I think we've got some questions from YouTube that Shuvo's posted in the chat box. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Bianca, are you there? So Bianca can assist uh, if you are, Jacinta, if you comfortable, then you can go for it. Uh, I've just pulled them up, okay? Uh, if that's okay, I'll just pull. Yeah, it's fine for and, me. And uh, yes, Bianca, uh, read it out if there is uh, some understanding of the questions. Actually, we're collecting the question from you and uh, okay, all are yeah. related to your talk, but we collected okay. all the questions okay. for you. And so shall I read or? Yes. Okay. Uh, so one question from Shivani Yadav. How to stay motivated during research? How to stay motivated during research. I've never had a problem staying motivated in my research. Um, I've always found it continue to be challenging as I go through with my, my, my research. Um, I, I guess, I, I, I'm, I, you know, I hate to say this, but if your research isn't motivating you, you probably should find something else to do. I mean, I mean that's, that's kind of harsh, but I hate to be that harsh. Uh, you know, um, I always, uh, let, let, me, let me, a good piece of research hopefully answers a question, but it has to ask a question. So, so I stayed motivating, motivated, not by the results, but what, what question, that research asked me, or I figured out, yes, or was that next question, okay, in, in, the, in the process. You know, uh, I worked a lot on, on disease and insect resistance. Um, and, you know, and, and so I, I would, so I put a gene in, okay, what's the next gene I can stack with it to ensure durable resistance using Roger Rahm's terms. So that was the question that I would be asking myself as I was doing it. So, it's two things. See what those questions are, and those questions should motivate you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if if that, that doesn't motivate you, um, maybe you should look to do something different. <laughs> I, I don't. I, that's harsh, but that's that's that, I'm, that's the only way I can be honest with myself. Okay. Yeah, I completely agree with this answer. <laughs> and the very good question I got it from Lorena. Um, asking is there any point where one has to stop with the professional development plan oh interesting any point we have to stop it well i'm retired i've been retired for six years i don't write it down anymore uh so i guess when you retire uh now with that said even though i don't write it down and i'm not as religious to it as a five-year review i did sit down and in, in and read a, I read a lot of books on how to retire, okay? I can recommend a lot of books on, on retirement. Uh, my daughter sent me a couple to read as well because she figured I was gonna go crazy. Uh, but one of the things I learned in the, my reading on how to retire it's, it was, is, is you have to figure out something to fill that void that work brought you. I, I call it making a difference, that, 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 that motivation, the thing that gets you up in the morning. Well, I found volunteer work. So I volunteer with youth. I volunteer with fifth graders. I volunteer in water quality. Uh, so uh, I do a lot of education on natural resources, saving our natural resources. Um, I'm on three different boards. 
uh, a chair of one here, local board. Uh, so I, I guess the answer, the point in time to stop is when you retire, but don't stop living. <laughs> Uh, but it's, I, I no longer view it as a profession. Um, let's put it this way. I don't, I don't want to work, but I want to stay active. But when my wife and I want to do something now, we can just do it because I'm not tied down to work. So, so that, that would be my answer. Yeah. Another question. What is your take to motivate the next generation when we find new generation are becoming least interested in plant science? Well, tell them they don't like to eat. <laughs> if they like to eat, they better be interested. Incidentally, I see who asked that question too now, because I can watch the chat too here. Uh, how do you, I, I, I think um, I, I would go back to some of the things I would say that Dr. Borlaug instilled in me, okay? Um, the value of training that next generation, the value of feeding the people on planet earth, the value of understanding the interface between plants, animals, and humans. Understanding uh, that, that value to, to make a difference for your fellow human being. To me, those are th that's kind of a, some of the things that Dr. Borlaug instilled in me. Uh, you know, uh, I've already given an example, you know, if you release 10 varieties and 10 graduate students, your, your productivity is 10 X, uh, training the next generation uh, is so important, but this is motiv motiv motivating them. Uh, with that said though, I will also tell you, I had a graduate student that spent a year with me and I noticed that enthusiasm was going now, going the wrong direction. Uh, he was outstanding senior student getting a master's with me at another university and he says, you know, it's just, I'm not interested in research. And he says, I wanna be a minister. And I said, that's fine. Go out and be the best minister in the world. Uh, so I think you have to, you know, it's, it's you, you, if, if there's, as I said, the one that said, you know, that, you know, how do you stay motivated? If there is no interest in it, I don't, I think you can help, you can plant the seed and you can water it, but you can't make it grow. Uh, I guess as you do it, but I, I think that's things challenge people, you know, challenge people to, to continue to think about how they can make a difference. So I would come to our next question is from Aliyu. What is the importance of soft skill to build a professional plant or how soft skill can help to build a professional plant? Well, soft skills are critical. I didn't talk much about them today. I talked about them more in the leadership side. Uh, you know, I, I, I go back to something my mother used to say, you have two ears and one mouth and use them in that ratio <laughs> or listen twice as much as you speak. Uh, I think, I think soft skills, uh, are listening without a question, uh, that, that, that you are critical. I, I also believe that one of the very important soft skills that it takes a while is, is reading people, reading the nonverbals. Uh, if, if you watch people's reaction to what you're saying, if you watch those nonverbals, I mean, in, a, in, in, if you're in an administrative role, those nonverbals can be very, very critical to you in a very important soft skill. Uh, seeing people pull back versus, aggressive leaning forward, seeing people smile versus the frown, reading those, those, those hand, hand, those nonverbal. So I think nonverbal uh, soft skills are, 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 are really, really important. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a soft skill per se, uh, but I think it, a, a characteristic is that I think is very important to this whole package is integrity. I, I you know, I, this is something my dad taught me uh, and uh, something I'll never forget when he says your integrity is yours. No one can take it away. You have to give it away. So I think the integrity, and that's why I go back admitting mistakes uh, in, in the process. So if, if I summarize the soft skills, I think, I think listening uh, and truly listening and comprehending in, in not only hearing it, that's only part of the process, putting it in your brain, and trying to figure it out. 
the soft skill of reading not the nonverbals, uh, I think is 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 extremely important. Uh, you know, uh, give I could give examples of graduate students where I could tell what they were they were starting to shut down with those nonverbals, and you've got to figure out a way to to uh, to, to to motivate and motivate them again. Um, I mean, obviously speaking and this, this, those whole skills like that, I mean, writing, uh, those are, I don't consider those soft skills. I consider those hard skills as I look through that. So I, I, I would guess if I really summarize this, it's, 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 it's listening, reading non-skills, and then, and then processing things and being able to interact with individuals, different individuals. Different people get motivated by different things. I used to always say, you know, one you have to pat on the back and the other one you got to kick in the rear. And if you pat the wrong, if you hit the wrong, do the wrong thing to the wrong one, you'll get a very bad reaction. So those are, I think, are the most important soft skills. Yeah, very enriching, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I would come to another question. What further development plans can we design for professional plant scientists around the globe under, under the pandemic? Hmm. Oh, well, the pandemic, it's, I, I, I said 2020 20 and 21 are two years that never existed. And, and as far as I can tell, I, I mean, I, I love communicating and the fact that we can communicate by Zoom, but I, I just really rather do things face to face. Um, I, I, you know, I, I guess as, as I look at it, um, even with the pandemic, I think you can develop a plan with those same criteria that I've talked about, the setting the goals, the evaluation, I'll write it down. I think you may have to let the pandemic change it somewhat as you look as you look at it. Uh, I mean, it's impacted everything in our lives, you know, as 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 I look at it in the process. Uh, but I, I don't. I think as 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 I. If I understand the question correctly, I, I think you have to continue on as much in normal life as a plant scientist as possible, given what the global pandemic's doing to us. Um, you know, I'm retired, so it's a little bit more difficult. I mean, I haven't traveled uh, since the pandemic, which would be very unusual for me, uh, which would be a change the pandemic put in place. But I think you have to continue with normal life is the best you can, even with the, even with the global pandemic. And, and I guess I, it's, it's like anything else. I don't think you should let it fear you from continuing to move forward. Yeah, and this is also very connected from this question. How much is modern plant breeding promising to bring food security to the ever growing world population? Well, I think it has tremendous potential. Uh, but just remember, plant breeders don't do it alone uh, in, in the process. And we talked about farmer education a little bit. I, I you know, the, the tools that are available today, uh, f, you know, I, one of the things I really struggled with, and I use Finley Wilkins model, if nobody knows what it is, because it's archaic on, on yield stability. Um, and um, the... Uh, yield and yield stability and trying to maintain that yield stability. I mean, we we're, we're fight so hard to stay where we are. <laughs> uh, disease, insects, climate change, heat, drought, all of that. Uh, I think the new modern tools uh, give us the ability to, to put some of that together easier so that we can concentrate on putting together the genetic potential. I, I can't remember, it's been a long time ago now, but I read if light was the most limiting resource, wheat's genetic potential would be like 600 bushels or, or what would that be? That'd be uh, what, uh, 15, 150 tons per hectare, something like that, whatever that number is. I don't remember what it is anymore. If light was the first limiting factor. I think these tools, CRISPR and these other tools have our ability to put, put genes, put genetics together that we just have never heard of. Now, Plant breeders don't do it alone. Uh, and I'm not talking about the entomologists and the pathologists and the statisticians that help us do this. That farmer's got to produce it. And the agronomist has to help the farmers to, to produce it. Uh, and the soil scientist has to work with the farmers to make sure that the soil fertility is there so it can be productive. So 
I, I guess, you know, uh, it, it's a package. And, and maybe, if, uh, maybe if I can answer this question from my perspective of how I would maybe do things a little different, I would probably, with my new varieties, I probably would have done more agronomic work, uh, you know, fertilizer rates and other things, seeding rates, just simple ag agronomics to maybe give a pulp, a better package to the producer to optimize the genetics. You know, uh, uh, I, I did that a little bit because I had a site where I could have some irrigation done so we could figure out irrigating to take a look at some of the, the, the better, uh, the better genetic potential. But I always knew that we were never optimizing the genetic potential that we had. So that's, 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 that's that other part of the equation. Uh, you know, as most studies say, uh, yield is 50% genetics and 50% agronomics and agronomics and influenced by the environment and G by E and how you reduce G by E and all. Yeah, long, long answer, tremendous potential, but we got to get the whole package put together with the producer. Got to put the package in the producer's hand. Farmers, like I said, a variety that, that isn't in the farmer's hand optimizing that yield, it's not going to do anything. That's good. So another question, uh, again, for soft skills from Rutuza. She's asking, what is a good time to start developing professional skills uh, in bachelor degree or master degree or after I get into the particular profession? Today. Today. <laughs> that is the best answer, actually. Yes. I, mean, I, I mean, I didn't start until I completed my PhD. Okay, that's because I hadn't, the thought process had never come across my mind. I was focused on research and genetics and physiology and pathology and statistics. And then when my major professor said, okay, what are you gonna do with all this stuff? <laughs> what are you gonna do with all this knowledge? And, and I said, well, I'm gonna be a plant brooder. And he says, well, you know, don't think things are gonna change during your career, you know? I said, yeah, they probably will. So I, I guess, if I would have started it over, I would have done it when I was when I was an undergraduate. I would have done it when I decided to switch from going back to the family farm to switch to get a degree in. Um, and when I when I decided to go back in the sciences, I knew I was going to go on for a PhD. So I would have done it right then, and I would have laid out my 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 plan right then. So I I guess the best time to start is today. For all the listeners. And the last question from Shivani Gupta, she's asking, I'm keen in research work, but at the same time in administrative services, I am pursuing graduation now. What should I do to find the best field for me? Uh, it's a career follow advice. Your follow your passion. Okay. I, 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 I use, I use I, I'm gonna use both myself in my children as examples. So here I go. Uh, my example is when I was an undergraduate and I had straight C's in economics and business and straight A's in science. I, I didn't, I couldn't see that. Well, my, my advisor said, you're, you're so much more interested in science than you are in business. Go into science. It's, that's where my passion was. Uh, my daughter picked up a camera when she was very young and she said, I'm gonna be a professional photographer. And I said, holy Toledo. Uh, I'm going to be supporting that one for a long time. She got a bachelor's degree in still photography, and she's a very successful photographer in California. Okay. Uh, my son got on the computer and loved it, fell in love with it. He's a, he, I don't even know what he does, just so it's legal in the cloud now. And he's a programmer making more money than I ever made working with a soft shoot of Google programming in the cloud. I talked about that student I had, one of the best students I had that was an English major. I converted it to a geneticist who ran a very successful breeding program in Ohio for, for Pioneer. I, you know, I follow your passion. That's, that's the best answer I can give you is, is and, and that passion changes. You know, mine changed from plants to people. And that's what my plan said. You know, I'm getting more passionate about people than I am the plants. I still love plant breeding. Like somebody asked, no, there's no such thing as a former plant breeder. You're a plant breeder for life. 
but my passion there was making a difference for people. So follow your passion. I'll, I'll end with this last thought, though. And that's a, a really good book uh, by, by uh, Collins. It's called Good to Great. And he says, if you're going to be great at something, you have to be passionate about it. The other subline of his book is, good is the enemy of greatness. So never settle for good. Move to great. But always, if you want to be great at what you're doing, you have to be passionate about it. That's why I love working with these fifth graders. They don't talk back or anything. They're just little sponges. <laughs> Getting this information. I just love working with them. So follow your passion. So that's all. Uh, I would like to ask Shrivo the next plan. Thank, thanks, uh, Priyanka. Sure. Thanks, sir. And we, we just selected those are uh, just a sample questions you can ask. And there are a lot of questions. It's not exactly to your term, but it, I'm, I'm sure through these questions, everybody get their answer and related answer. And uh, I got two, three requests in YouTube chat box. They want you as a supervisor from <laughs> Pakistan, from uh, 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 from another is uh, just utopia. So everybody like your talk, your career guidance. And uh, uh, as, as I feel that uh, it's happened and it's happened very frequently in, in our country and developing country also, because we are more focused on our hard skill and little bit focused on our soft skill initially. And, and uh, we learn it when we start something. So uh, that is the reason that we incorporate a soft skill in bioengine platform. It's help you to open up, to present your research better way. And also it's very important to understand our situations of our supervisor, our mentors, that how they face and during the, uh, during when they are guided us. So it's a, uh, uh, it's a platform to learn these soft skills to better our plant science research in future. So we are very glad you, you respond to our invitation. And uh, I'm sure in the future, your, uh, your like uh, uh, leadership skills uh, training and all, we are again invite you and uh, uh, ask you to join us. Uh, because uh, I know this this one slide you it it can be one lecture one webinar your one slide's content is at four five six points but it made so many days so many time to you can you you if you try to elaborate then it's uh, maybe four or five webinars on a, each presentation it's each page of your presentation so glad everyone uh, very. Thanks. Uh, they 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 also thanks us Bioengine to um, invite you in this platform. And uh, as you shared your email address, uh, two three people are asking your email address, so I forward your Gmail address to them through the email. We got thirteen hundred plus uh, registration for your webinar, and till we. 800 views we got your uh, presentation during your presentation and it is open and free for all so in coming days it's going more and more views uh, throughout the world uh, from the behalf of bioengine i thanks you to come and enlighten us about your life experience and your every is is very thoughtful your just look into the future and learn something from the first. These are the motivational for us also. So we can, we can focus, we can uh, do our job in better way and still we try to build a community service like this one, Bioengine to everyone to interact in a platform where we can discuss and talk about our little bit, uh, this type of questions too that uh, what should I do and uh, what will be 
the consequences and uh, what is the better uh, so i know this sometimes these questions is very specific and sub case to very case to case but uh, we address this question and ask you to just inform others that we all face this problem we learn from this and we build from our mistakes thanks thanks uh, sir for joining thank you very class. much sir thank you very much i also thank shoma jasinta and priyanka to help us to do this webinar so successfully we, well thanks sir. thank you for the opportunity um you know uh i i'm open uh as i said that's why i put up my email and and uh Franca sent me, luckily sent me a thing on signal because I, I don't know, I don't know what I put in the wrong date in there, but anyway, um, the, uh, uh, I apologize again for that. Thank you for the opportunity. I think, uh, bye and Jean, uh, I think, you know, you, you talk about, uh, how you help that next generation. I think this, this does help that next generation to continue to provide them the information, skills, challenges, uh, what those opportunities are. I think that's, that's kind of uh, what it's all about. Um, and, and I'm, uh, I'm open to work with uh, you again or anyone again, as I, as I move through, I, I have a little more free time than I used to have, but so uh, I, uh, I, I, en I enjoy this. I enjoy, as I said, my passion went from working with plants to working with people and developing that next generation. That's why I love teaching within the basic weed improvement program with Simmet. So uh, I, I compliment you on the program and thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much. And sorry about the late night. <laughs> oh, it's no problem. Okay. It's only uh, 1030. You know, sir, I particularly liked what you said that, that uh, you know, um, you have uh, used it in the, the, the same, use it in the ratio of two ears and one mouth. <laughs> 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 I just love that. <laughs> You like that one? Yeah. Uh, well, it's true. You should. Yeah. I'm not going to forget that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we should be listening more. Yeah. <laughs> okay. it, was, it was wonderful. I mean, so much. You covered so much. And uh, if if they hear you and if they if the viewers listen to all that you said, they could apply it in their specific fields, you know? So yes there's no specific answer to all these questions maybe uh, you know, for their particular fields but they the applying portion is up to them mm -hmm. yep you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink <laughs> right it was my it was so amazing that you came and uh, this experience is great and i'm sure the viewers are really excited for today's webinar and uh, you know mm, I can see that in the chat, in the uh, live responses, and uh, and we really hope that we will be connected to you in the future also. I'm 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 open to it, and next time I'll even write the date down right. <laughs> I just, but, I, but it's commendable how you you know just came huh. with such a short notice. That 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 is called experience, Soma. That is called experience. <laughs> Well, it's also called admitting when you make a mistake. And I, 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 I knew it. I wrote it down in my calendar wrong. <laughs> my calendar will go off tomorrow night. I'm, gl I'm glad I finished, I finished yes. going over my notes this morning. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we, we are very, we, actually, our intention is to chat with you because our, it, it, we, we, we know many things about your uh, chat into uh, just uh, interactive sessions with viewers and interview so it's uh, very very uh, inspiring it's, uh, and i'm sure it, it's available in uh, youtube so many people will find inspiring in future and i uh, or priyanka I'll let you update it time to time like uh, uh, what type of scenario is going on in uh, bioengine with your talk but it's a it's a bridge, and many people will connect to you through this platform. I'm sure you're getting many mails, <laughs> so uh, be prepared for that. <laughs> yep. You will be yep. getting many mails. Do you? Uh, I would like to add your mentorship uh, getting uh, tighter and tighter now, uh, Fred. Okay, thank you. <laughs> if just to, to ask a question. Um, 
if I do get emails, do you want me to communicate back to you uh, that I'm visiting with no, individuals? No, 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 no. no. Okay. no. Just you can, you can, yeah, you freelance can talk. Now. Free, yes, yes, no okay. problem. Okay. Uh, our, our, uh, our responsibility is up to here uh, to bring you this platform and join to audience to you through the Baba Engine. Now you can talk, you can decide to whatever your, uh, if you need any assistance from BioEngine, we will do that. That is, no, that no, is no. the thing. And I will send you all the others information related to your talk, your registrations, your certificate. Like uh, uh, many people are submitting their application for certificates. I got 213 certificate applications right now, but it will be up uh, time when I close the certificate application process. Okay, uh, okay. sounds so, good. Uh, I send you everything in a uh, compiling everything within two days and send you an uh, email with this information. Great. Thanks, sir. And thank yeah. you again for the opportunity. Welcome, sir. It's, uh, okay. it's our thing. Uh, thanks, uh, Priyanka. Thanks, uh, Jacinta. Thanks, Soma. And thanks all the viewers from throughout the world. It's our privilege to serve you and it is our responsibility we think it is our responsibility to bring more and more webinar our next webinar on 30 of november uh, from the university of dhaka bangladesh professor hashina and uh, it is going to be on jute uh, jute crops it is a fiber crop uh, and uh, India is the highest producer. Bangladesh is the second highest producer of wheat. And uh, we are also arranging a, a CRISPR vector designing workshop on 8th of January 2022. But the registration process is not started yet. So be patient. I will update it, every information in our website. And all these things are going to be online is open to everyone and it's free of cost. So be connected with us. And if you need any, any information, any queries, just email us admin at bioengine.com and social media. Every information given here in the description box in YouTube. Thanks, sir. Once again, namaste. Take care. Good evening.